Okay, so um, in the previous lecture, we um, discussed the conditions that we need uh, in order for the horizon of a large black hole to be smooth. And we argued that we need to be able to identify a new set of operators, B tilde, uh, with a property that um, they have to commute with the bees, uh, they have to be thermally populated as the bees, and they have to be entangled with the bees in a particular way, uh, which you can determine by doing effect field theory uh, around the horizon. Uh, here you see a two-point function between these two guys being a bit tilde which is non-zero, which implies that th these two operators are actually entangled. And then we presented this, uh, this paradox, which was based on the commutation relations of the operator of the Hamiltonian. And uh, we uh, found this negative trace. And then the question is, uh, can we actually find operators bit tilde in the CFT with the desired properties? Now I will follow, uh, I will present a, a, an approach uh, that uh, will give us uh, these operators in a constructive way. And the idea is based on um, uh, some work that I did with Sukrat Raju uh, in the previous years. And the intuition is the following. If we look at the exterior of the black hole, we have these operators B. So this is the black hole in ADS. And here we have operators P, which seem to be thermally populated. So these guys are thermally populated. Now, the fact that they're thermally populated means that uh, their two-point functions are thermal, and higher point functions uh, approximately factorize, uh, which means that there is no significant entanglement between the Bs. So these Bs seem to be thermally populated, but they're not entangled with each other, which means that there must be another part of the system with which these operators B are entangled. This other part of the system, uh, we do not yet know how to represent in terms of operators, but uh, uh, what we're trying to do now is to use this entanglement to identify a new set of operators with which these B guys are entangled. So to repeat, uh, we have a set of operators whose correlation functions uh, suggest that these operators are entangled with something, and we're going to use the entanglement in order to identify uh, this other part of the Hilbert space that purifies the operators B. So this second part of the Hilbert space that we will try to construct will play the role of the B tildes. And together, the Bs and the B tildes can be used to reconstruct the smooth horizon for the black hole. So now the idea is how do we start with, an, uh, with a set of operators which seem to be entangled, and how can we construct from them the, the remaining operators with which our operators are entangled. So there is actually a very natural mathematical construction which allows us to do this in a canonical way, uh, which goes under the name of uh, Tomita Takasaki modular theory. And uh, let me uh, describe what is the, the, the idea of, uh, mathematically, and then I will try to apply it to the particular problem that we have. The idea is that we start with a Hilbert space and a, a particular state psi in the Hilbert space, uh, as well as an algebra, uh, a phenomenal algebra of operators acting on the Hilbert space with a property that, uh, first of all, uh, the, state, the state is cyclic with respect to the algebra, which means that we can reconstruct the full Hilbert space by acting on the state psi with elements of the algebra. Uh, now, to be a little bit more precise, we, uh, this definition means that we should be able to get a dense subspace of the Hilbert space, so we should be able to approximate any state we want to arbitrary accuracy. Uh, but I will just to, to, save, uh, to, to write it uh, uh, more quickly, I will uh, write it in this way, that the Hilbert space is spun by the algebra act on the state. So this is the first condition. The second condition is that uh, it's called that uh, the state is separating with respect to the algebra, which means that there are no uh, annihilation operators in the algebra. You cannot annihilate the state psi with elements of the algebra. So uh, just to give you some intuition, uh, the second condition uh, can be thought of as expressing uh, algebraically the statement that uh, the state appears to be entangled when you probe it with this algebra. Let me give you an example. Uh, if you have two spins, um, suppose we have two spins, and um, suppose we take this state, take this state, sorry, now there's no entanglement. This state is direct product. And suppose we define this small algebra to be the spin operators on the first spin. 
Now, in this situation, when this, the spin operators of the first spin act on the state, uh, it, it, it's clear that uh, the state is not entangled, and in particular, uh, we can see that we can't find annihilation <laughs> operators. For example, if you act with a raising operator of the first spin of the state, you get zero. So if there is no entanglement, uh, you can find annihilation operators in the, algebra, in the smaller algebra. If, on the other hand, you look at the same system uh, for a state with entanglement, uh, up, up, plus, down, down, then you can convince yourself uh, by trying uh, all kinds of examples that it is impossible to find an operator in, the in, this, in, the algebra, in this algebra which will annihilate the state. For example, if you act with this raising operator, it will uh, annihilate this component, but it will not annihilate the other one. And more generally, you can check that there is no annihilation operator in the smaller algebra defined on the first spin. So uh, when we have an algebra acting on a state, and it, uh, if we cannot find annihilation operators in that algebra, then it means that uh, there is, uh, the state is entangled with uh, another part of the system, and uh, our goal is to identify that other part. So uh, this uh, theory allows you to identify the, second, uh, this, uh, re the remaining part of the system with which your algebra is entangled, and uh, it can be done in, a, in, a, in the following way. So uh, this theorem says that uh, if you have this algebra acting on the Hilbert space, and if these two properties are satisfied, then uh, the algebra has a non-trivial commutant, A prime, which means there are some new operators which commute with all elements of the algebra, and these operators act on the same Hilbert space that we started with. You don't need to enlarge your Hilbert space. Finally, this uh, commutant A prime is isomorphic to the algebra A, and uh, these two algebras are entangled in a very particular way, if these two conditions are satisfied. So to connect to what we're trying to do, for us, uh, the operators in the exterior of the black hole will play the role of the algebra A, and the operators uh, that we're trying to construct will play the role of A prime, the commutant. They're in commutant because they're space-like relative to A, so they have to commute. And uh, as we will see, the entanglement pattern that you get from this theorem is precisely the one that you need in order for the horizon to be smooth. Yes? Yes. Yeah, I, I will explain what is the meaning of the state in the black hole context in a little bit. Yeah. So in this construction, you start by introducing an antilinear map, uh, which is defined by uh, uh, considering uh, all possible states that you get by acting with elements of the, alge of the algebra of your state of the reference state psi. So this small a is an element of this uh, algebra, and we consider all possible states that we get we can get by acting with elements of the algebra on the state psi, and we, then we define this antilinear map as. Uh, by the following equation, we define it as uh, the mapping which takes this state into the state A dagger times psi. Now, already at this point, uh, it, it, in order to be able to define this operator S, uh, we are actually using the statement that the state psi is separating, meaning that there, are, there is no annihilation operator for the state psi. Why is that? Well. For example, if you could imagine a situation where uh, the state psi was annihilated by an operator A, but at the same time, the state psi was not annihilated by A dagger. For instance, this happens uh, if you have a quantum field theory and you look at the ground state of a free field and you consider an annihilation operator, then it annihilates the vacuum, but A dagger does not annihilate the vacuum. So if you try to define this operator S, uh, in that case, you would run into a contradiction because you would be trying to define an antilinear operator taking a vector which is zero to something which is non-zero, which is inconsistent. So just to be able, from the starting point, to define this operator S, we need to have the condition that the state psi uh, is separating. So this, what I'm trying to do now ca cannot be done, for example, if you take A to be the algebra of uh, Minkowski space operators and uh, the state psi to be the ground state of the field. 
Then uh, we take this uh, operator S and uh, we consider the polar decomposition of this operator, which means uh, we divide the operator into, uh, let's say, an, uh, uh, so normally when you do the polar decomposition, you take an operator and you, divide, you, you write it as the product of a unitary times something which is positive and Hermitian. But since this operator S is antilinear, in this particular case, this operator J is going to be anti-unitary, and delta is going to be a positive Hermitian operator. Now, this delta you can also write as S dagger S. In some sense, it is a magnitude of this operator S. And uh, as we will discuss later, this uh, object delta, uh, or actually the logarithm of delta, the minus the logarithm of delta, is what is usually called the modular Hamiltonian. So, so this is the setup, this is the starting point, and then the theorem makes the following statements. First of all, if you take this algebra A and you conjugate it by this object J, you generate a commutant. So you, get, you generate um, a, a new set of operators which act on the same Hilbert space with a property that they commute with all elements of the algebra A. So what we want to do now in this context is to uh, start with these operators outside the horizon uh, this will be a, the algebra A for us. We want to co build up this structure and define this object J so that J A J will give us the algebra which is hiding behind the horizon. Moreover, uh, from this definition, you can check that uh, J squared is equal to one. Uh, uh, so this means that this commutant is isomorphic to A. So in particular, the set of operators that you will construct on this side of the black hole are going to be in some sense, isomorphic to the operators that you had on the right, on the exterior. So this is very natural from what we expect um, um, by the usual analytic continuation of a black hole to the Kruskal diagram. We get, let's say, a second copy of the, of the exterior region. Then there are a few more statements. Uh, there's a statement that if you take this uh, explanation of the modular Hamiltonian and you think of it uh, formally as a, a time evolution operator by some parameter s, then the theorem uh, says that uh, the algebra A is closed under this uh, evolution, and uh, the same is true about the commutant. So I will explain later what is the, the, the physical meaning of the statement in the case of a black hole. And finally, uh, there is some sort of uh, formal KMS condition, which is that if you take two elements of the algebra, A times B, and then you take one of them and you displace it by, uh, by sort of evolving it using the modular Hamiltonian, then this function F has some particular analytic properties, and uh, it, it, ha it obeys some sort of periodicity, uh, which is uh, uh, similar to the KMS condition, which I wrote down uh, a little bit earlier. So all these statements are, uh, are mathematical statements about uh, the situation where we have this algebra and the state, which is cycling and separating. And we will try to apply this theorem to the case of the black hole in order to uh, construct uh, the copy of uh, the operators which are uh, hiding behind the horizon. Now, uh, before I go on, are there any questions about, uh, about this so far? Yes, the modular Hamiltonian, by definition, is given by the logarithm of uh, this object that we call delta. Okay, let me give you an example of how this works in Minkowski space. So uh, we already talked about it in the previous lectures that you can take Minkowski space and you can divide it into Rindler wedges. And then uh, it is very, uh, it's clear that we get two, al uh, two algebras, uh, the algebra of operators which are localized in the right wedge and the algebra of operators in the left wedge. Uh, so th I will call this A and this A prime, uh, where uh, the reason we do it is because uh, we sort of assume that, um, well, by locality these operators commute with A and we also assume that these are the only operators which commute with all operators uh, on this side, which is true for free theories, for example. And uh, we will now uh, start by uh, working with this algebra, and we'll try to see what we need to do in order to reconstruct the second copy. So th this will be a toy model of what we want to do eventually with a black hole. So we'll try to apply this theorem in this case to see how it works, and then we'll do a similar thing uh, in the case of a black hole. Now, in order to uh, set up, the, to, to apply this theorem, we have to verify that um, the conditions uh, that um, I, I wrote down before are, are satisfied. In particular, we want to make sure that uh, the, so the state that we will be working with will be the Minkowski vacuum. So the state psi for us is going to be the Minkowski vacuum. Uh, 
So we want to verify that the Minkowski vacuum is cyclic and separating with respect to the algebra, algebra of operators localized in one of the two edges. So to remind you, uh, these two conditions means, cyclic condition means that uh, we can generate the full Hilbert space by acting with uh, uh, operators the, on the right edge. And separating means that uh, we cannot find any annihilation operators uh, on the right edge. Now, the fact that we can get uh, the full Hilbert space of the quantum field theory by acting operators on the right edge is a well-known theorem in quantum field theory. It's called the Ries-Schlitter theorem. And uh, it is very easy to understand if you work with a, uh, with a free uh, quantum field theory and you write down the Minkowski vacuum in terms of uh, Rindler modes. Uh, if you want, we can do it uh, this afternoon explicitly. And then you can verify that uh, by exploiting the entanglement between the two sides, uh, any state you want to generate uh, on, on the full Hilbert space, you can, uh, you, can, you can generate it simply by acting on the vacuum with operators uh, in the right way. So it's known that the, the, the Minkowski vacuum is a cyclic state with respect to the algebra of operators in this region. And uh, you can also prove by using the same theorem that you cannot find any annihilation operators which are purely localized in one of the two edges. The intuition is that, uh, as you know, if you have an accelerated observer uh, in one of the two edges, this observer will detect the thermal gas of particles, which means that he does not see the vacuum, but rather a thermally populated uh, uh, state. So if you have a thermal state and if you act with a lowering operator, you do not annihilate the state. You just remove one particle from the heat bath. So uh, an observer who is localized in one of the two edges cannot annihilate the Minkowski vacuum. So both of the uh, assumptions of the Tomita Takesaki theorem are satisfied. We have an algebra, we have a state which is cyclic and separating. So we can try to apply the theorem to see how we can recover the left side from the right side. Okay, so the starting point is to consider uh, Lorentz boost on the TX plane. So for, uh, for real parameter S, so the Lorentz boost generator is K. And for real parameter S, for a real Lorentz boost, the coordinates are transformed in this particular way. Now, what we will do is we'll consider uh, this operator when we take the parameter S to be complex. So we'll consider a complexified Lorentz boost and then, in particular, if you take the parameter of this Lorentz boost to be i times pi, uh, if you plug it into these equations, uh, you can verify immediately that uh, t goes to minus t, x goes to, to minus x, uh, while the transverse coordinate y remain invariant. So a complexified Lorentz boost maps points uh, on the right wedge to points on the left wedge. So in particular, uh, what we're trying to do now is to build up this operator S for the case of Minkowski space divided into the two Riddler wedges. And we, what we want to do in principle is to consider um, any element of the algebra of the, of the right wedge, so a, a product of operators on the right wedge, acting on the vacuum, and we want to find an operator S that will transform the state into a dagger times psi. Now, to, to, to make the presentation short, I will only show you how it works in case you act with only one operator on the vacuum, and you can look at the literature how to generalize it to the situation where you have many operators. So we consider uh, the situation where we act with phi t x y on the Minkowski vacuum, and we want to find what is the operator s I have to put here in order to get phi dagger at the same space-time point. So the first observation is that if I use the, Lorentz, the complexified Lorentz boost that I introduced, uh, it takes this state into a state where I have flipped the first two coordinates, but the transverse coordinates remain the same. So this is not yet what we want. It's not the correct thing yet. But suppose that we take this operator and we combine it with a rotation by pi around the x-axis, which rotates the transverse coordinates y into minus y, and in addition to that, we act with a CPT operator which maps minus t minus x minus y back to t x y. Then we find that if we act uh, on this state by the product of these operators, the complexified Lorentz boost, the rotation around the x axis, and the CPT transformation, then uh, you can check that the space time coordinates are mapped back to themselves, while this operator phi gets a dagger because of the CPT operator. 
So then it means that uh, for the Minkowski vacuum and for the decomposition into Rindler wedges, this operator S can be taken to be a CPT times a rotation times a complexified Lorentz boost. Now, in the way I did the derivation, I was not very careful about the domain of analyticity of this complexified Lorentz boost. Also, I didn't do the case where we have many operators here, but this has been worked out in this theorem, and you can check that uh, all the steps can be made rigorous. So all in all, what we find is that in the Minkowski vacuum, if you take uh, any operator on the right wedge and you multiply it by this object, you get <coughs> a dagger acting on the Minkowski vacuum. So we were able to find what is S for uh, this particular example. Let me write it here. So then we can proceed and uh, calculate what is the model Hamiltonian. I remind you the model Hamiltonian is uh, S dagger S. And if you take that uh, result and you calculate S dagger S, you find that this, uh, this object, uh, theta squared is one, this object is unitary, so it drops out. So you are left with e to the minus two pi times k. So the model Hamiltonian uh, for this particular example is, uh, is given by the exponent here, where k is the Lorentz boost. So we really derived what is usually done in the Unruh computation, where you start with an accelerated observer, and uh, by expanding the field in modes, after a while you prove that um, sort of uh, the, 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 de the reduced density matrix that the accelerated, accelerated observer detects is a thermal density matrix where the Lorentz boost plays the role of the Hamiltonian, and 2 pi is the inverse temperature for, for inner space. So, um, now the, uh, let me just mention that this derivation that I, uh, that I, I gave here can be done for an interacting quantum field theory, so it does not rely on, on weak coupling, so uh, it's more general. Now, we identify this object, object delta, and uh, we can also identify this anti unitary operator J, which maps uh, A into A prime. And in this particular case, this J has a very simple geometric uh, form. It is a product of a rotation around X and the CPT transformation, which uh, clearly, if you take an operator on the right wedge and you conjugate it by this object, you get an operator on the left wedge. So it allows you to uh, map A into A prime. So this is how this theorem can be applied into, uh, in, in, in the case of Minkowski space and how it can, uh, uh, if you start with the right wedge, it can give you the left wedge. It can give you the operators on the left wedge. So before I move on to the black hole, are there any questions about this? Here? So R1 is a rotation by pi around the x axis. So uh, we're looking at the Rindler space. So we have uh, x, t and some transverse directions that they call y. And the point is that the Lorentz boost that we started with was a Lorentz boost on the TX plane. So y was invariant under this Lorentz boost. And by considering the complexified Lorentz boost, what we mapped was TXY into minus T minus XY. Now, then we took this uh, new point and we transformed it by rotating uh, by a factor of pi around the x-axis, which uh, leaves x invariant, but it rotates the vector y into minus y. And uh, so all in all, we start with t comma x, y, we do the, the complexified Lorentz boost, we go to minus t minus x, y, then we do a rotation around x, we go to this guy, and then we do a CPT to go back to the point that we started with. That's why uh, we get this nice equation, which gives you, uh, well, you start with a state uh, where you act on the vacuum with an operator on the, left, on the right waves, and by acting with this combination, you get a dagger, I mean, fight, the, the dagger of this operator acting on the vacuum, which is what we wanted to have. No, it, it can be generalized. Uh, um, if the background is symmetric enough, then, uh, so the question is, if you, first of all, formally, uh, you can generalize it, but there's no guarantee that this delta you will get is going to be something nice. Or this J 
that you will get will generally not be something that acts locally. So uh, if the background has symmetry, for example, uh, if you take ABS uh, Rindler, so if you take ABS phase and you divide it into Rindler wedges, uh, then you will probably get some generators here which are uh, uh, nice and uh, geometric. But if you do it for an uh, arbitrary background, then uh, you can define these objects, but they're not going to be nice. Uh, well, uh, for example, it can be worked out in a ringless space. If you have a conformity theory, it can be worked out uh, uh, around uh, diamonds, uh, causal diamonds, um, uh, ball-shaped regions and their causal development. Um, but I also want to mention that this construction depends on the state, not only on the region, but also on the state. Because this entire construction that we're talking about uses an algebra and a state. So far, the state was the Minkowski vacuum. So all these nice, simple results hold when the state is the vacuum and the algebra is the algebra of a nice region of space. Uh, if you take an excited state, uh, formally you can apply some of the steps, but again, the modular Hamiltonian you will calculate is going to be something complicated. Does this also work for the distance? Probably, yes. Yes. If, that's right. Yes. No, no, that's fine. Uh, that's okay. I mean, what we ha so the question was. Uh, yeah, we want to define an uh, anti-linear operator S, right? So if you start, even if you start with a field phi, which is uh, which is um, uh, Hermitian, you can always multiply it by a complex number. So we want to make sure that this mapping is anti-linear. That's why we have to go through this. Uh, we, we need to use this, this uh, theta operator at some point. OK. So this is how we apply this construction to this particular example, where we started with a quantum field theory, and we divided the space into two parts. And we found that this part of the space of the quantum field is entangled with the other part. And then we use the entanglement in order to express these operators uh, by in terms of this uh, um, delta and j and the operators acting on A. Now, in the case of the black hole, uh, the, the, there's, there are some similarities, but uh, there's a crucial difference, which is that uh, we do not have a division of the algebra of operators in physical space. So it's not that we are taking the CFT on the boundary and we're dividing the CFT in two parts. Instead, uh, if you think about it, we want to divide uh, the CFT into uh, the exterior of the black hole and the interior of, and, and the region behind the horizon, but uh, the, this division is spherically symmetric on the boundary if the CFT lives on a sphere. So it's not that we're taking a sub-region of the boundary. We're taking the entire uh, spatial slice where the CFT lives, and somehow we want to define the sub-algebra of operators acting on that region that will play the role of the operators acting on the exterior of the black hole. So uh, the, the correct way to think about it is that uh, the division is not done in physical space, but rather it's done in uh, the space of operators. And basically, we define the space of operators into uh, uh, simple operators, which are defined as uh, single trace operators of low conformal dimension, as well as their products, and all the remaining operators. So just to be a bit more precise, here we're considering only the operators which, have, which are dual to uh, supergravity fields. So these are operators whose conformal dimension does not scale with n or lambda. And we are allowed to multiply them together uh, with uh, imposing the condition that uh, uh, when you multiply them together, the number of factors should not scale with capital N, where N is the rank of the gauge group. So in this way, we define a, a small set uh, which um, uh, will play the role of a small algebra for us. Uh, so, uh, and uh, from the gravitational point of view, this small set is what is necessary in order to describe effective field theory in the exterior of the black hole. So, uh, so, so in this way, we define a small algebra, uh, the product of single small product of single trace operators, and we're going to apply the theorem uh, using the microset of the black hole psi and this uh, object A, which will play the role of a small algebra. Now you may complain that uh, if you impose the condition that you only consider small products of, of operators, this set is not properly in algebra, so you cannot properly apply the previous theorem. Uh, but actually, uh, in the larger limit, uh, this uh, limitation that you have uh, 
uh, in the number of factors is not very important. And as I will explain a few slides later, the fact that this set is not an exact algebra, and as a result, we cannot apply the theorem in an exact sense, is actually uh, 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 an advantage of this construction rather than a problem. Because as we will see, this limitation is precisely what realized the idea of black hole complementarity that we introduced uh, yesterday. So anyway, let me describe the construction and we'll come back to this point a little bit later. So we define a small algebra and we also define uh, what we call a small Hilbert space, which is defined uh, by taking uh, the state, the microstate of the black hole, and acting on it with elements of this small algebra. So you take the black hole microstate and you act with one single trace operator, two, three, four, and then you take the all linear combinations of those states. This defines a subspace of the full Hilbert space of the theory that we call H of Psi. And uh, it is obvious now by construction that the, al the algebra A, uh, the state Psi is cyclic with respect to the algebra A if you restrict your attention to this small subspace because we define this subspace H of Psi to be the span of this algebra acting on the state. So now we have this algebra A and the set Psi, and we have the first condition that the algebra is cyclic with respect uh, to this state Psi. The second uh, condition that we'll try to, to show is that the state is separating, which means we cannot find any annihilation operators inside this algebra for the state Psi. Why is that? Well, that follows from the fact that the state Psi uh, appears to be thermal when you probe it by single trace operators. So we wrote down this inequality, this uh, approximation a few times earlier. Uh, if you have a, a, a correlation function of operators O, single trace operators on a, a very heavy state in the CFT, uh, you can approximate it by the thermal uh, correlation function up to one over n corrections. And uh, in a thermal correlation function, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you cannot find any annihilation operator because, uh, let me just show it. Uh, suppose uh, we could have, uh, so let's take any operator A in the small algebra, and let's consider the norm of the state A psi. I want to check that this state is not zero, right? So uh, what I need to do is to calculate a dagger psi, uh, this, this object, which I can think of as a correlator of that form, and then I can approximate it by the thermal correlator plus one over n corrections. And then now it is obvious that this, this quantity here is non negative because uh, this is a positive operator and this has positive eigenvalues, so that this is not, not, it cannot be zero. So we cannot find any annihilation operators for the state of psi inside the algebra. So what we have found is that uh, this uh, algebra A and the state of psi have the properties that uh, psi is both a cyclic and a separate vector for this algebra. And uh, then uh, the theorem that I mentioned before implies that we can define a new set of operators acting on the same Hilbert space with a property that they commute with all previous operators. And in particular, as I already mentioned, this theorem implies that the entanglement pattern between the original operators A and the second copy you generate is precisely the form that we will need in order to identify those operators with those living in the region uh, A prime, which is on the left side of this diagram. Now, uh, just let me make one more comment. Uh, you can also check that in this particular example, uh, you can uh, try to, uh, to see what this delta is. So this delta is this dagger times S, and uh, if you use the KMS condition, which I mentioned a few times, and larger factorization, you can prove that this is a particular example. The model of Hamiltonian uh, with respect to the state psi and the small algebra A is nothing else but the CFT Hamiltonian well, shifted by E0, where E0 is the energy of the state, times beta, where beta is the temperature of the state. So we have a very simple expression for this model Hamiltonian in the larger limit. Um, and uh, then we can proceed and uh, define these operators using the equations I wrote down before. And you find uh, a set of linear equations uh, which define how these operators, or tilde, uh, 
which are defined uh, by uh, what I, so uh, O tilde are defined as J O J, where O is any single trace operator and O tilde is a, a second copy that we defined by this procedure. And using this construction, what is guaranteed is that these O tildes will commute with the O's. So this O tilde commute with the operator O. So we found that it is possible actually to define a, a second copy of the operators of the conformal field theory acting on the same small Hilbert space, what we called uh, this called subspace in the previous slide, with a property that they commute with the usual single trace operators. And uh, if you look at this equation a little bit more carefully, you find that uh, they also have the correct uh, correlation functions, meaning uh, if you look, for example, um, at the first uh, equation, uh, so if you take this equation and you multiply it by by O, you find that the two-point function O tilde O O tilde. where this is a usual two-point function of single trace operator at finite temperature. And if you go back a few slides uh, where we wrote down the conditions for uh, a smooth horizon and we had some two-point function between, uh, sorry, between uh, B and B tildes, you find that uh, if, you, if, you, if you compare this one to that one and using this relation, you find that uh, they're actually the same. So uh, we find that uh, the operators defined by these equations have precisely the right properties in order to be identified with the operators living uh, on the left part of the space-time. And then combining these two guys together, you can reconstruct the future wave as well as the past waves of the black hole. Now, let me emphasize that these operators are defined only on this small subspace, A sub psi, and not on the entire Hilbert space of the theory. So you can complain now, I mean, if they're not defined in the full Hilbert space, how, how can we work with these guys? The point is that um, all experiments that we're going to do in the bulk, I mean, we're trying to reconstruct the bulk at the level of effective field theory. So we only want to, come to, to reproduce, to reconstruct low, low point correlation functions of the local field in the bulk. And those low point functions can be uh, entirely characterized by correlation functions inside the small code subspace by definition. So we don't need to worry about how these operators are extended away from this code subspace. It's not relevant for computations that you do at the level of effective field theory. Now, on the other hand, the fact that these operators are defined only on this subspace means that there is some sort of uh, dependence of these operators on the state side that you started with. So remember, we started with a particular black hole microstate psi, and we defined the cold subspace around it by acting with single trace operators on, on the black hole microstate. Uh, if you start with a different microstate psi, you will generate a, a, a different subspace, A of psi prime, let's say, which is not going to be the same as this one. And then these operators of tilde for the new state will be defined to act on the new cold subspace, A of psi prime. So in that sense, these operators depend on the reference states of the black hole that we started with, and that's why we, we call them state-dependent operators. So once you decide what is the reference state of a black hole that you're going to work with, these guys are linear operators acting on this particular uh, subspace of the full Hilbert space. So once you decide what's a black hole microstate, they act as linear operators on the Hilbert space. However, there is some implicit dependence uh, of these operators on the particular microstate that you want to study. Also, please pay attention that since we define these guys only on this small subspace, even though I wrote down the equation before that the commutator is zero, we should keep in mind that this commutator is zero only inside this small subspace and not necessarily over the entire Hilbert space. So it's not, this, this is not an operator equation. It's an equation which is true only when you calculate correlation functions inside the cold subspace. <coughs> 
Now, uh, another uh, technical point that uh, I wanted to mention is uh, when I wrote down this, uh, this little argument and I told you you cannot find annihilation operators, uh, I was a little bit too quick because uh, uh, if you take modes A and A dagger, which have very high frequency, uh, the thermal expectation values of those modes uh, are uh, suppressed by Boltzmann factors. So, uh, in general, if uh, this omega, if this frequency is very large, then at some point this uh, exponential separation will become very important and the, the state will be able to almost annihilate the state and then some steps in this construction break down. So uh, the restriction that comes from this uh, consideration is that uh, when we fully transform these operators and we have this Fourier modes omega, uh, we should impose an upper cutoff in the frequency that I call omega star, which can be very large, but uh, it should not be N dependent. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, so the question was um, when I when I identify these O tildes with uh, um, the things which are on the left, do I assume hack duality? So, if I remember correctly, the statement of hack duality is that. Uh, in the case of um, in Kosky, uh, of quantum field theory in Minkowski space, the, the statement is that uh, uh, the commutant of A is actually not larger than all the operators which are contained on the left. Yeah, we, we always know that uh, all the operators here commute with A. It could be that there are some additional operators which commute with A which are not visible somehow here. And the, I thought the statement of fact duality is that these are precisely the operators that commute with A. Well, he, here, unfortunately, uh, I assume a lot more in the sense that uh, this, this is a, a gravitational theory, right? Uh, the discussion you're talking about is a discussion in quantum field theory. So here we are talking about gravity. We're trying to reconstruct the left region in the bulk, right? It's not a, a left region on the quantum field theory. So um, there could be a lot of subtleties uh, along those lines, but uh, for now I just want to have a... a uh, let's say a first approximation in defining these operators that can have the right correlation functions in order to describe the infolding observer. So, I mean, this question that you're asking is, 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 is uh, I think, is, is um, very complicated to address in the context of, of gravity. So, are there any other questions? Yes. I have a yes. <laughs> we started with the one sided black hole. Correct. So, we have one boundary. Correct. Yes. Very good. Yes. Correct. Yes. So let me repeat the question. The question was, uh, we started with a one-sided black hole. We have one CFT in a pure state, so there should be only one asymptotic ADS region. Yeah. But the way I'm doing it now, I'm producing a second copy of these operators, it looks like I will be able to reconstruct the full left side, including the asymptotic region, which will be sort of equivalent to reconstructing a left CFT, exactly. which should not be there. Exactly. Yes, well, I don't know if it's, well, uh, we shouldn't be able to do that. And it's precisely this restriction which uh, does not allow you to extrapolate this construction or, you know, very far away uh, towards the left in the asymptotically uh, ADS region. So this, as I will explain uh, in a, a couple of slides, this restriction on the frequency omega imposes a restriction on how far towards the left you can go. So there's some limitation on how far you can reconstruct towards the left where this distance is determined by the cut of omega star. So how do we see that? Well, uh, in ADS there's a gravitational potential, right? So if you want to go very near the boundary, you need very high energies. If you want to write down a wave packet in ADS with very high, uh, which is very close to the boundary, you need to use Fourier modes with very high frequency because the, 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 this wave packet has to climb up the potential well. So if you want to reconstruct the region very close to what would be the left boundary, you would need to use frequencies omega which are very high. And those are not allowed in this construction because of this restriction. So we are not able to fully reconstruct the left region all the way to uh, well, where the boundary would have been. There's one asymptotic boundary, but what we're trying to argue is that there's some space-time here. 
uh, as well as there, right? Well, it, it sort of mimics the thermophilic double, but not fully, right? I'm, I'm saying there's a cutoff. In the thermophilic double, there's no cutoff. In the thermophilic double, you can go all the way to the left. Yes. Yes. So we only have the right safety. However, what we're saying here is that uh, there is something like the left region, but not the entire left region. There's part of space time there. Yes. So Well, the left region is part of the right CFT, right? The right CFT describes both the exterior as well as the left region. So the left region, I mean, what I'm concerned about is whether there's any assumption in the left region and whether there's some asymptotic radius region that we can... No, no, you cannot, you cannot study that region because you, we have imposed this condition that does not allow you to, to you know, set up uh, experiments where you will send particles very close to the region you want to study. Uh, sorry, which second statement? <coughs> so the qu <coughs> No, th these, sorry, these are operators in the conformal field theory. So the question was, is it that this equation is valid only near the horizon, up the horizon? Well, uh, no. These guys, O and O tilde, they're, both of them are operators in the Hilbert space of the conformal field theory. So they're defined on the CFT. So it's, this equation is true only if you uh, evaluate this commutator inside a particular subspace of the full Hilbert space of the CFT. Yes. Yes. Then uh, I can uh, identify each operator with, uh, with uh, an operator on the right and on the left side. There, there's no left safety. No, in the, the thermal field up. Oh. And uh, then I see uh, 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 Good, good. So uh, the question is, uh, suppose that we actually have the thermal field double, you could try to reconstruct that region uh, by just a conventional left safety, or you could try to do something like this. How can this to be consistent? Actually, if you apply this, these equations, uh, this tomita takesaki theorem, on the right CFT, and if you're in the thermophile state, you automatically get that the, these mirror operators are the left operators. So the construction by itself knows how to deal with this complication that you talked about, and I will, I will present it uh, a little bit later. Sorry? Correct. No, for the O's there is no cutoff. For the O's there is no cutoff. Oh, yeah, yeah, because, uh, well, uh, I mean, the CFT contains operators O with all frequencies, right? Then at some point you want to define a small algebra where you select some operators and you put them there and then you try to double them, right? In that selection, we do not include operators O with frequencies which are too high. No, no, because, uh, well, uh, okay, not necessarily, right? Because uh, this, this construction is, is needed if you want to define these O-tilde operators. Once you define them, no, nobody prevents you from using all the O's then, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that, that's, the, that, that's the point of complementarity, right? And this idea that the Hilbert space of the quantum gravity does not factorize. So it looks like it's causally disconnected. And at the level of the cold subspace, it seems to be causally disconnected. But fundamentally, as I will explain a little bit, uh, actually, you can rewrite these O tildes in terms of the O's in a very complicated way. Uh, no, I think you can, no. You, you will recover the factorization of correlators, but not the factorization of Hilbert spaces. So 
Complicated observables like, for example, entanglement entropy or things like that may not have the naive classical limits. Okay, I think I need to accelerate a little bit and then uh, during the discussion session we can... Uh, there will be one hour, more than an hour discussion session this afternoon, so yeah. given the time, maybe we can finish what he wants to say and then... Okay, so now we define these operators that we call the mirror operators and uh, now I'm coming back to this point that I mentioned earlier that this set A is not really an algebra and in particular this theorem that we use cannot be applied in an exact mathematical sense. Uh, and this implies that this A prime is not an exact commutant. Now, you may worry that this is a problem, but actually, as I already mentioned, from the physical point of view, this is a desirable feature because what it actually means is that this A prime, which you naively think is a commutant, is an independent part of the Hilbert space, as you said, in reality, is not really independent. It's somehow hidden inside the, uh, the algebra that you started with. So, um, Okay, so in that sense, there is, as, as we discussed already, there's some non-locality in reconstructing the interior in this left region, uh, which can be probed once you start considering operators which uh, approach this cutoff of the algebra. So if you start multiplying many of these uh, uh, single trace operators, order n of those, then you, start, you can start seeing this non-locality. And, um, uh, okay, this we already said. So, uh, so the, the picture that we're getting to is this one. So we have the exterior of the black hole described by the operators O and this left region by O tilde. And if you combine them together, you can describe, for instance, uh, the interior, the black hole interior, uh, which you can do more precisely by uh, doing an A scale L-like construction, multiplying these operators by some wave functions and these other operators by some other wave functions. And then you, ca you can verify that correlation functions of this guy reproduce what you would naively expect in the in a smooth black hole, in the hard Hawking state. Now, this cutoff on the left is determined by omega star. Uh, this cutoff on the frequencies, uh, I already explained the physics of how it works. And uh, as I already mentioned, this region should, be not, should not be thought of as a, a fundamentally independent part of the Hilbert space. It's already included in the Hilbert space of the right CFT. Uh, now, these operators are state dependent. Uh, why? Well. Uh, they are defined, the equations which define these operators use a reference state psi, so they, they're manifestly state dependent. So what you could ask, could it be that we can sort of build up these operators for every single cold subspace in the theory and then combine them, combine them together into a consistent globally defined operator? The answer is that it's not possible. Uh, the reason is that um, the number of microstates psi you can write down is exponentially large, right? Because every black hole microstate gives you a given psi, so there's a huge number of these psi's. So all these cold subspaces have, if you combine many of them together, all of them together, they have significant overlaps. And then these equations cannot be applied simultaneously on all of those cold subspaces. In fact, we already know that this cannot be done because uh, we had this paradox before, remember, like this negative trace that I mentioned earlier. Uh, which suggests that you can never find a single operator acting on the entire Hilbert space that will reproduce the desired correlators. So the way that we were able to avoid the previous paradoxes is by allowing these operators to depend on the microstate. So in particular, uh, remember when I told you this, uh, this we, we had this trace, uh, e to the minus beta h, b tilde, b tilde, dagger, we found that this guy was negative, right? That's what we showed uh, earlier. Now, uh, what we're saying is that this guy, the way you have to select this operator depends on the microstate. So then, in that case, it doesn't make any sense to take the trace, which is the average over all possible states, because when you do that, you have to keep track of the dependence of this operator on the state. So this argument cannot be applied. So there, there's no, all the previous paradoxes can be, can be avoided. Uh, also, yesterday I mentioned uh, that there's an intuitive paradox, which is that if we want to have a smooth horizon, we need to have very specific entanglement between the interior and the exterior. And I try to argue it's very hard to understand from the point of view of statistical mechanics why a typical state would end up having the correct entanglement. Well, in this construction, we define the operators by the entanglement. So by construction, they always turn out, turn out to have the correct uh, entanglement. So we, we talked about this complementarity a little bit. So, uh, so we were able to define these O tildes uh, because we restricted our attention to a small algebra of operators O. Now, if you start enlarging this small algebra, then at some point this construction breaks down. 
How does it break down mathematically? It breaks down because this construction depends on the condition that uh, for any element of the algebra, a of psi must be uh, non-zero, right? That was a separating property. Now, if you make the algebra too large, if you include, for example, all single trace operators without any restriction of how many, how many of them you multiply together, then you, ca you can actually find some very complicated combinations which will annihilate the state. And then this entire construction breaks down. So this means that the notion of this O tilde is meaningful only if you restrict your attention to a small algebra of operators on the CFT, which is precisely the spirit of complementarity, namely that uh, the interior of the black hole uh, makes sense only if we uh, consider effectively theory of the exterior, but fundamentally, the degrees of freedom of the interior are already contained in the degrees of freedom of the exterior. So uh, that is nice uh, because um, it is in some sense a, a more mathematically precise realization of the idea of complementarity. And uh, in the case of the black hole in flat space, if we extrapolate, it would imply that uh, it is consistent to assume that the Hilbert space of the interior and the Hilbert space of the interior have overlap such that in simple correlation functions, simple commutators between, let's say, one operator here and one operator there, the result is equal to zero or perhaps exponentially small. However, in principle, you can find some very complicated operators in the exterior which will have significant commutators with operators in the interior. So this suggests that locality can break down dramatically once you start considering very complicated operators in the exterior. By complicated, we mean that we are multiplying order S black hole uh, operators. Now, the fact that, so this is a concrete uh, realization of the idea that the Hilbert space uh, does not factorize fundamentally. It appears to be a product when you look at low point functions in effective field theory, but fundamentally there's no factorization. And if there's no factorization, the previous uh, uh, argument of the monogamy of entanglement, the strong subjectivity paradox we discussed yesterday cannot be applied because uh, the strong subjectivity paradox uh, requires as an assumption that you have a factorization of the Hilbert space into A, B, and C, which is not the case. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the one problem of complementarity is uh, it was that it was not obvious that you could reconcile it with locality, but in this particular construction, it is obvious that uh, locality is a very good approximation for low point functions, uh, even though it breaks down at high point functions. Now, uh, in the last uh, three minutes, let me just mention the connection with uh, the eternal black hole. So you probably know that uh, uh, if you have two identical copies of the CFT and we take them to be in a particular entangled state, the thermofield state, then uh, this uh, state is supposed to be dual to the eternal black hole. Uh, so now somebody asked the question, what happens if we uh, try to define the mirror operators in this case? Well, uh, it, it's, it's very, uh, it works out very nicely. So if you define your small algebra to be the algebra of uh, the operators on this side, so if this A is defined as the algebra on the right, and you follow these steps, what you find is that A prime is precisely the simple operator of the left CFT. It comes out automatically, uh, precisely because this tomita Takesaki construction selects the other operators by their entanglement, and in this particular state, uh, the simple operators here are entangled with simple operators there, so the whole thing is consistent. So if you define the mirror operators of the right, in this case, you will just get the left operators, which is what we expect. Uh, you can also test uh, a, a more a kind of sophisticated example where uh, you, um, instead of taking the thermophile state, you consider um, another state of the two uh, CFT Hilbert space where you have the same amount of entanglement, but the details of the entanglement have been randomi randomized. So instead of taking this nice diagonal state, we write down some uh, generic entangled state between the two CFTs. We can take this to have the same mass as this one on both sides. And uh, this represents a, a, a typical highly entangled state, but where the details of the entanglement are very different from the fine-tuned entanglement of the thermofield. And then you can try to define the mirror operators of this uh, algebra. And you find that now they are not the left operators. There's, it's a new set of operators, and you can define the mirror operators of this guy, and they are not those. So uh, in this uh, case, we find that uh, the prediction is that you will have two disconnected interiors. So two black holes, each one of these has its own interior, but there is no uh, wormhole connecting them. 
uh, which what, what you would expect uh, in any case by considering correlation functions on the state, which uh, I can explain later today. So what I want to say is that this construction works also in situations where we have two CFTs, uh, not only in the original uh, case, but also in more general uh, situations. Um, so I'm out of time. Uh, so there's two more slides. So more recently, um, Gao, Jeffers, and Wall found a nice way of probing the interior of the of an eternal black hole by uh, certain double trace perturbations, which allow a particle to uh, traverse the wormhole. And uh, this is very useful because it allows us to probe the interior of the two-sided black hole by um, by correlation functions from the boundary without having to define local operators in the middle. It's a little bit like an S-matrix experiment. You send things from the exterior and you see what comes out. You don't need to define local operators inside the black hole. So it's very useful and it provides evidence for the smoothness of the horizon of the eternal black hole. So what we did is that we uh, used these mirror operators to uh, set up a similar experiment in the one-sided black hole where you start with a black hole in equilibrium and then you can excite the left sides so normally this particle would not be able to escape, but by using the, the analog, an analog of the gauge Raphael's wall uh, experiment, uh, we can also generate these additional perturbations which allow the particle to escape. So we have done this, we have done some calculations uh, in the SQK model, as a toy model, and this provides evidence uh, for the physical, uh, that this left region is actually present and uh, it, it has the interpretation that we just gave, that you can have particles living there and you are able to also extract them provided that you uh, perturb the boundary state with appropriate operators. So I think I have to, to, to close. So maybe we can continue with more uh, details during the discussions. So thank you. Okay, so I propose not.